Welcome to the first episode of Full Stack Cast. In this podcast, we are going to take a closer look at the humans behind Full Stack Fest, our ever growing roster of amazing speakers. Their talks inspire us by widening our perspective and deepening our knowledge. But behind each one's well known technical expertise, there's an often lesser known, well rounded human with a wide range of interests and a unique life path. Full Stack Fest is an inspiring conference about software. It's happening in the first week of September in Barcelona, and it's organized by Codegram, who also produce and sponsor this podcast. I'm your host, Chus, and today's guest is Reginald Braithwaite. Reginald has spoken twice at our event, and more recently he's been a fantastic master of ceremonies at last year's edition. I'm told that when he's not programming Lisp in JavaScript, he's either writing his next book, playing music, or just enjoying a cup of coffee. Welcome, Reginald, and Happy New Year. Thank you so much for taking the time for this episode. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm happy to be here. I love everything that I that has been a part of my life that has come from being involved with uh, Barcelona RubyConf, FutureJS, and Full Stack Fest. And it's a real pleasure, you know, to talk with you again, and perhaps for some of us to be able to share our conversation with some of the people who are interested in what's going on. Yeah, I always feel, honestly, when at the conference, at the speakers' dinner, for example, I get to chat more informally with some of the speakers, and I always feel like, wow, sometimes we talk about things that are not even necessarily related to tech, but they're so interesting. And I wish people would uh, hear those conversations in a way, like some of them are really insightful. And I think it's a kind of a way to share our our experience with the speakers with with a whole lot of people who might be interested. So I was just going to say that speaks to the heart of what makes um, a good conference, you know, like Full Stack Fest so important. Um, it's almost like I have had the privilege of speaking at conferences and I sometimes feel like there's nothing I can put in, in a talk that I couldn't put in a blog post. So why are we all here? Well, we're all here so that after the talk, people can go out, mix and mingle and have those conversations. It's almost like the talks are an excuse for the conversation. Yeah, an excuse to hang out, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why people are there. And so, um, yeah, uh, just as you say, these conversations that are had in the, you know, in the auditorium you know, during the breaks or in the lunches, which I thought were really well organized to have people going in various groups and perhaps mixing, um, you know, were brilliant. Um, and perhaps this kind of a conversation, being able to share it, will do the same thing. Can I tell you a little story? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So there's a thing. It's not really a conference. It was called Macworld. I don't know if they still have it, but at one time, you know, before the internet and all this stuff, uh, they used to have these big, huge, something like a, a industry thing where all the people making uh, Macintosh hardware, uh, accessories, software, and so on would go and display their wares, pay ridiculous rents, and, you know, all these people would walk through and have a chance to try new things. Anyways, I was going from my home in Toronto to Macworld in San Francisco. And while I was down there, I was going to do a little bit of business. And my partner and I decided that what we were going to do is fly to Chicago. And then there was this train called the California Zephyr that was going to go from Chicago all the way to Oakland, which is a twin city to San Francisco. Then our, on our way back, we would take a different train called the Coast Starlight up the coast to Portland. And then finally, a third train, the, the Empire Builder from Portland back to Chicago, and then we would fly to Toronto. So we'd have this rail holiday with um, a conference. Nice. Now, the part that I want to share with you, which I think is re relevant to what we're talking about, the spirit of, of a good conference, is that in the evenings, if you were traveling in, um, you know, with a um, cabin, there was a dining car, and they would... Uh, you, they would set up a time for you to go and eat and they would actually reserve a table for you. And what they said was, please let us choose where to seat you. I mean, they won't argue with you if you have a really strong preference, but they, but they prefer that, the, that they, the staff, choose the seating arrangements. And what they did was this. If you were a single person traveling, they would seat you with three other single people at a table for four. And then every meal, they would change things around so that you would be sitting with different people. 
And their argument was always, yeah, I, you probably, maybe you meet someone, you want to have dinner with them, but you can always go, all, you've got like a whole day on the train or whatever. You can go have coffee together or dessert. You can spend a lot of time together in the bar car. You know, let us help you mix and mingle. And if you go as a couple, they would, teach, they would seat you with another couple and then rotate them around. So you'd meet all these different couples. And, you know, if you clicked with wow. a couple, you'd have a chance to go off and talk and do other things. And That's so cool. Yes. I, and I'm not, I, I realize that the logistics of trying to do that with lunches at a conference is probably prohibitive. But there is something magical about kind of sometimes randomly saying, hey, I have no idea who you are, but this conversation is really cool. We should, you know, go have lunch or whatever. And then finding out maybe there's a click and that might be the start of something that, you know, goes on your whole career. Maybe there isn't. And what have you done except meet somebody and had a coffee with them or something? Yeah, I've, I've seen that happening at Full Stack Fest and, and not only there, like at many conferences, even myself, uh, just going there. Like the main reason why I started submitting talks to conferences um, is not only because I get to share my ideas and, and travel to other places, but to meet other speakers for me has been literally life changing. I've met a lot of interesting people. And you feel like they're, you know, your idols, you know, the, the people you see on the internet and you get to meet them in person, but then you realize, oh, you know, they're just next to you having dinner. It's like, hi. And, you know, you go out and you have coffee, you have a drink and, and you get to meet them. And I've made a lot of friends that I still keep it's so this fun. way. So uh, it's really great. I, I really like it. Yeah, I love it too. And it's easy for me to say, and you may nod your head and say, yes, Absolutely. But it's hard sometimes to really sort of feel it. But if somebody sits next to me, and maybe they're at the beginning of their career, and they might say, oh, that's Reg Braithwaite. He's been programming since the 1980s. Oh, my God. Oh, I what am I going to talk to him about? Meanwhile, I'm saying, oh, for crying out loud, everyone thinks I'm a JavaScript guy, but I haven't kept up to date with the last five frameworks that have come out. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never used TypeScript. People say gulp, broccoli, webpack, zucchini, whatever, and I'm <laughs> lost. I have no idea how to talk to this person. So the two of us could be sitting side by side going, I, I have no idea. It, 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 all you have to do is just start talking and then you find the common ground. So sometimes it's so intimidating. But the truth of the matter is everyone kind of feels that. Oh, how do I talk to this person? But if somehow you start, then it just goes because we're all people. And we have these things in common. Yeah. And, and, you know, there might be a few fits and starts to the conversation, but sooner or later, inevitably, there's like a little click, you know, and, and, yeah, and, and the two of you, they're like, oh, man, I know exactly what you mean, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, you're best friends. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's hard to, to realize that speakers at events and stuff, they're, they're just humans, right? So like, you know, they have a lot of things in common with you, even if you think they're just your heroes, you know, the, who wrote this framework or wrote something, you know, they're just humans and they maybe like the same things as you do, or they have the same problems and the same insecurities. Sometimes like everyone has someone they look up to and then they think, you know, they're not as good as, you know, well, I mean, what's called imposter syndrome, exactly. right? It's, it's a thing. Yeah, everyone has it. I think. Every, everyone has it. It's, it's described, I mean, it's obviously a little bit more complicated than this, but the thing I've heard is it's when you compare your blooper reel to somebody else's highlights. <laughs> exactly. It's got nothing to do with who's really competent. As long as you're comparing on that basis, it's always going to seem, seem like somebody else is better than you are. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's such a good description. <laughs> and so I really, um, you know, I really have seen that at Full Stack Fest. And, and then its previous uh, predecessor conferences, just the incredible power of people either meeting speakers or, you know, meeting each other. The person sitting next to you in the audience, the person, you know, the person who's in front of you in line for uh, a coffee, the person who ends up going to the same restaurant with the, cube, with the tickets you get at Full Stack Fest to go and have lunch. Th 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 those are way more valuable. You will remember those friendships that you form or those professional associations, those contacts, you will remember them long after. What did Reg talk about at FutureJS? Do you remember? I actually have difficulty remembering. I think I was talking about trying to keep JavaScript small as a language. But, you know, the thing I remember most is that I had a lot of pictures of Spanish cyclists. <laughs> I remember that more than I remember the content. Yeah. But I remember the people I met. And I remember the feeling exactly, you yeah. know, of, 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 of going to this type of event, which is, and it's one of the things I love. I mean, there are, I've been to some bigger conferences and they have a special power themselves when there's eight tracks or something, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot to that. And I see the importance, mm. but 
the benefit of a conference, like a single track conference, and there are a couple of outstanding ones that I've been to, um, and Full Stack Fest is certainly in this category, is that it has this intimate setting. Everyone you talk to has seen the same talk you just saw. Everyone is there for the same, roughly the same reason you're there. And so I feel like if you allow it, the ability to meet people, break the ice, and have powerful conversations about what you've... It's not, it's not that there's no purpose to the talks. There are powerful conversations to be had around what you just heard or saw. Or just to make fun. Oh man, did you see Reg dance? Yeah, exactly. Have, have that's a a, that's quite Share a, a laugh. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that happens quite a yeah. lot, and it's good. I think it's great. It's a shared experience. What do you Exa- say? Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's something that um, that has been one of the great benefits of having a single track um, conference is that it makes it easier to have this shared experience with people. Yeah, I think we we definitely intend to keep that part because it's. Uh... It's essential, I think, to the to the core of it. Well, I don't want to tell you what to do. I just want to say I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, with a person like you, you know, very like multifaceted, I have a lot of things I want to know. Okay. And, um, basically, I, I assume at some point you were not programming in your life, and now you have like multiple books <laughs> about programming, and like some of them are really uh, deep topics and re- really kind of foundational stuff and recursion and all this stuff, you know, kind of hard topics that a lot of people, um, they're scared of. So I'm curious, how did you get into programming? Well, um, unfortunately, I got into programming at a time when it was hard to get into programming. Um, so, um, and, you know, I'm just going to editorialize here and say that with every passing year, we do a good job, I think, of making it easier to get into programming. And I think that's very important. But I was fortunate in that my mother was a systems analyst Mm -hmm. at a time when that involved mainframes. There were no PCs. And uh, for example, when I was a small boy in the 1960s, I remember there was some defective memory, so they replaced it. And the memory that they took out of the computer, they said they were going to throw it away. They weren't going to fix it. They were going to throw it away. So my mom thought I would find it interesting. So she actually brought it home for me to look at so I could see what computer memory looks like. And um, this is a podcast, so people have to use their imagination. What it was was a lattice. I don't know how big. I'm going to say, you know, like half a meter by half a meter with like a metal frame around the outside. If you could imagine a square frame like that you would have a a picture in. But inside, I said it was a lattice. Um, Going horizontally, if you hold it up vertically were all these little metal wires that went from one edge to the other and the same vertically. And every place the wires crossed, there was a little tiny ferrite loop, like a donut, that went around at a 45 degree angle. Hmm. And in fact, this was what we today call core memory. And the way it stored memory in RAM, this was the random access memory, was that by sending a current one way, the magnetic field would go around the torus, the little loop in one direction, and then you could do with a, you could send electricity the other way, and it would reverse the way the the, the um, magnetism went around. And then the other, um, I'm not sure the exact thing. You'd have to look it up. I I, sh- I should have Googled this. Maybe I should Google this. We'll pause and come back to the conversation, and I'll sound like I know this off the top of my head. But <laughs> the um, by doing it the right combination of impulses between the two wires, you could read or write a one or a zero at each one of these locations by reversing the direction of magnetism in this, you know, ferrite iron-like donut. Wow. I mean, as I'm imagining, it looks like an alien device. Yes. And to be perfectly honest with you, every time I bring up this story, I try to make a note to myself that at some point I have to get on eBay and try to buy one of these. I would like to have it on my wall like art. So I was exposed to this from a very young age, and I became curious about it. And, you know, from my social book, inklings i'm glad that i had that opportunity i you know i'm very thankful for that opportunity and and just but i want more people to have that opportunity (laughs) yeah um but uh then i didn't actually program at that time there's no way for example for my mom to take her son to work and have me just start fooling around with an ibm 360 but um what happened a little bit later was i found myself in a um there was on saturdays there was kind of a program for kids who were interested in different subjects, and they organized it like a university. They had all these um, instructors, you know, who are kind of like camp counselors, yeah. and they and they and each of them had a course that they were offering, and they all pitched the course, and then you signed up for the courses you wanted. Cool. And um, I remember I signed up for chess, 
and I signed up for something called Who Done It, H W H O D U N N I T, <laughs> which was literally I discovered later. It was roughly based on the writings of Martin Gardner, who was at that time the mathematical recreations editor of Scientific American, and so they had logic puzzles. Um, they had a um, various uh, devices where you could draw curves and things, you know, and then they would talk about the curves and, and you could try some things. So there's a lot of stuff about sort of sort of practical math things and magic with cards, but then talking about how the magic with the cards is actually based on um, the exact word, but the remainders or modulo arithmetic. You know, there's various math, uh, card tricks you could do if you know these things or the way things add up. And one day, and so I was going every Saturday and, and, you know, attending this thing. And one day they said, we're going on a field trip. And they had arranged a bus and we went to the University of Toronto. And they showed us two things. One was um, they had these rooms with APL terminals. And you talk about alien. A the APL programming language is absolutely alien. It's, it's amazing. I, um, it's, it has evolved. I think the, uh, the last iteration of it was a language called J, but it was a truly alien uh, language. Um, the terminals had a, were IBM Selectric uh, terminals, which worked with this ball that would hit the, um, I think it was called a platen or something. And by changing the ball, you would change typefaces. And APL had its own ball because it had all special symbols. There was none of this stuff like regular programming languages now where we try to make everything with the Roman alphabet. They had sp their own special mathematical and programming symbols. It, it just... Oh, that, I've heard of yes. that. Yeah, that's that's what AP APL kind of rings a bell in that yeah. direction, right? And what a beautiful three-letter acronym. The APL stands for a programming language. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working okay. with? A programming language. Me too. <laughs> um, Anyhow, there was that and they, on terminals, and it was interactive the way, and in those days, that was a big deal, Lisp or whatever, that you could just type things and things happened. And that was amazing. And the instructors knew how to do this, and they showed us some things, how you could like add things up with like a slash and a series of numbers, slash plus a series of numbers or whatever, and then you'd get the sum and whatever. It was amazing. Like I, I literally, I, my brain was just, my little brain was just overflowing. Then they took us to another room and... That room was full of all these people and tables, and there were these punch card machines. And they showed us how you could type programs onto punch cards, one punch card per line. And then when you had your program, you would go and get another punch card, and all, your, your program was on white punch cards. And these other punch cards were colored. And the different colors, they had something big written on them, like WAT5. I remember this. Because what WAT5? W-A-T-F-I-V. I found out later what that was. Watt 5 was the Waterloo Fortran compiler version 5. It succeeded Watt 4, which was a much funnier name because in English you sometimes say, what for? <laughs> What's that for? <laughs> Watt 5 doesn't mean anything, but Watt 4 is kind of funny to me. There was another weird one. I can't remember the colors or anything, but you could get one of these cards that said Lisp on it. And if you typed the right thing with a lot of parentheses, you were programming in Lisp. Wow. And there was one called Snowball, which was an amazing programming language that has influenced my thinking to this day. And that's the one I ended up liking even more than Watt 5, which was Fortran. But if you took your program and you put this colored punch card at the front, it's kind of like a shebang thing now. You know, it tells the yeah. computer, this is the programming language. And you would put it in this hopper and somebody else would put theirs in behind yours. And once it was in the hopper, you would go and wait. And after a while, it would come out of the hopper. And that meant that it had read it into memory or tape, but it didn't actually mean it had run your job. But, it, but at that point, it was actually sort of in the computer. So then you could wait at another place. And the other place was this big line printer, big, like 132, very professional, very loud. And so you would wait. And then whatever came out of your program would come out there. So this was like a batch job, no interactive programming, no writing, you know, tic-tac-toe game or whatever. But you could write programs that added things up or, you know, solve problems or try to solve the eight queens problem or whatever. And the magical thing about this is that there was no security guard at the door saying, are you with the university? Are you supposed to be here? The APL terminals, terminals actually had a login. I remember that because I tried to use them and discovered that you had to have an account. But this room, it was called the high speed job stream. It was designed for undergraduates to do their assignments. And because nobody used computers in those days, nobody thought we need to protect it against unauthorized people using it. Interesting. So I just came back myself and just started using them. 
And I just kind of started teaching myself programming. Oh, wow. And no one even knew you were there. Well, I mean, there were all these undergraduates and they could see there's like a 12 year old kid or 11 year old kid in there, but they're busy with their assignments. What do they care? As long as I don't get in their way, nice. it's, it's not a problem. Uh, so I just started teaching myself programming and I honestly f fell in love with it. It felt like magic to write programs and to have things happen. It is magic. And well, in the kind of machine you're describing, it looks even more like magic, like some kind of strange, very strange. Although I will tell you there's, there is practical magic. Uh, today's computers do not need this at all. There might be like three gamers who will tell, or, or maybe Bitcoin uh, m mining rigs are like this. But um, at that time, they were mainframes. And the way mainframes actually looked, there were terminals and things all through the building connected by wires, of course, right? But the machine itself was in a machine room. And the machine room had like glass windows you could see in it, but you weren't allowed in unless you, because this is where you could do serious damage to a multi-million dollar computer. It, I mean, these were very expensive. They had as much as 64 kilobytes of RAM, these machines. So, you know, they had to be, you had to take care of them. They were very special. Wow. Yeah. 64K. I kid you not. That, that was like state of the art. And um, the machine room had a raised floor because there were all these cables running between the various parts. It wasn't one computer in one place. The different things, memory, input, output, disk drive controllers, were all in their own cabinets. And the way they built them was the cabinet sat on this raised floor, and then all the cables to go from one to the other, which were the buses, went underneath the raised floor. So you could walk between the cabinets, and they had blinking lights or adjust things, and there were tape drives and things like that. But you walked across the floor. And if there was some, some hardware maintenance that needed to be done with the cables, the floor had these huge big tiles, and they would take, I don't know if people today, I don't know where they would see something like this. If you work with a person who does windows, there's like a device you can get that has two suction cups and it makes a handle so you can hold the glass. Mm, and yeah, sometimes I've seen people that. who are daredevils climb buildings with these things. Oh, I haven't <laughs> seen that. <laughs> well, you too. But you know the type of thing. It's a handle, you put it on and you, you, you do a thing and then it's got these two suction cups and you're holding glass. Yeah. But if you put it on this floor tile and lift it up, underneath are all the cables. Now, I said cables, but I left out the important part when I say practical magic. And the important part is these machines got hot just like today's machines. And so in order to make this work, the machines had to be air conditioned. The machine room was cool and the machines themselves. And so they had this big air conditioning unit and the way it got its, the air conditioning to each of the boxes was it had tubes under the floor, just like all the cables that ran under the floor into each of the cabinets. Now, if you have all these air conditioning uh, cables under the floor and then you like close the floor up, under the floor gets very cold, right? Now, let me ask you, do people working on computers get thirsty? Yes, they do. And how do they slake their thirst? Oh, beer. no way. Where do you no put the way. beer? <laughs> they use it as a fridge? They would put the beer under the floor. <laughs> I swear to you that if you wanted to know where the beer in the machine room is, you lift the floor and there you find they have all their bottles of beer tucked away under the floor where they stay cold. Wow. Also pop if they wanted or whatever. But yeah, the beer was traditionally kept. In. So there's, there's magic and there's practical magic. Yeah, definitely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, getting back to it, I was, you know, I was entranced by this. I, I really felt like it was magic. There wasn't at that time, and I, I want to be very, there's a lot of things I really like. I like to talk about recursion. I like to talk about algorithms. I like to talk about the wonder of programming. I like to talk about the way my brain feels. I like to talk about the way I feel when I talk to other people who like programming. But there's nothing particularly more magical about that than sitting down and saying, you know what, to me, it's just a job. I'm feeding my family. Or for me, I'm writing this thing because I'm trying to change the way people work. Or I'm trying to change the way books are sold. Or I'm trying to, I mean, those things are all just as valid. There's no like, it's not like one path is somehow more than the other, just because you think you're a wizard and it's magic and so on. That's not, that's not special. It's, it just happens to be what works for me. But, you know, we're all people just trying to get by. But for me, that's what it was. It was, it was this feeling of being able to do things that, you know, before seemed impossible. Like today we would laugh, but being able to, um, you know, print multiplication tables or more complicated mathematical things I couldn't solve myself, you know, and figure out how to do it. And then when I wrote a computer program in a later context on a mini computer that could play chess and beat me. Now, I'm not, a, I'm a terrible chess player. 
So I'm not saying that it was a good program, but there is something, I, I get the attraction of people who are, fall in love with artificial intelligence <clears throat> or with big data and machine learning. The moment at which you make something which is at least as good as you are, whether you want to debate you created you know, intelligence or not, but there's something like, oh, wow, you know, I made something that does what I do, but better. And that's magic too. Yeah, that, is, that does feel like magic as well. Yes, absolutely. So in my case, what I did was much simpler than you would think. There's a, there's, a, there's a variation of chess. I tried to make a full chess program, and I could not do it in the limited memory that I had. I had 16K on that machine. But there is a variation of chess that is simpler, in which one player has all the chess pieces, and the other player has a single piece, which is the power of a queen, a king, and a knight. And so I gave the computer that piece so that it had fewer choices of moves to analyze. And then I had the full, uh, what is it, 16 pieces. And I, I could do whatever I wanted. And it had to try to checkmate me. And I was able to make a program that could beat me. I've su subsequently discovered that if you study it very hard, the player with all the pieces can actually always beat the other the player with that one piece. But I didn't know that. So I was satisfied with my program. Wow. That's actually quite cool. Yeah, that's how I got started. And, and you know what? I'm not the only one. There are people... Our industry is so much more interesting now. There are people who would talk the same way about discovering how they made certain, you know, uh, 3D realistic scenes in a game engine. That's magic. <laughs> you know, yeah, just... that is actually magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's other people who will sit down with CSS and whatever. And I mean, we made it, we probably all laugh now at, from 10 years ago or whatever, when everyone started making rounded corners. But there are people who sit and make certain types of visual effects and so on from a design perspective with CSS and whatever. And I feel like it's magic because, because you know, CSS confuses me. And, you know, I know that they, that they feel like the same sense of pleasure. Look, you know, look what I did. And it's like, wow, yeah, look what you did. That's amazing. It's so exciting. Yeah. I, recently, I watched this talk. I think it was... Um a guy working for Oculus and he's on the Oculus Go team as well. And he was building a game and optimizing it for Oculus Go. And there was a talk, it was like an hour long talk about all the tricks he used to optimize it to, to make it run fast. And it, it really looks like magic. Like you realize games are just smoke and mirrors. Like it feels very complete, but it's all like effects and like trickery. It's just like, you know, objects disappear all the time to save memory. There's just one big texture like mapped over everything. It's just all lies. I know. It's beautiful. <laughs> there's nothing... it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Beautiful. And, and sometimes there's something else to it. A long time ago, uh, Lucasfilm uh, got into the game business. I think it was called LucasArts or something. They had a game division. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah. So um, you can correct me because I'm just working from my memory here. I don't have any notes. But if I recall correctly, one of the games was called Rescue on Fractalis. Mm, I haven't played that okay. one. Okay, so uh, no doubt our listeners will Google it and then you know correct my my memory and whatever. And that's part of it because our conversation is really an, uh, an invitation to a conversation with everyone who's listening. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but as I recall, it was called Fractalis because one of the central things about the design was that it I think it was like a side-scrolling thing where you flew a spaceship and you had to rescue somebody or something. But the 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 point was that the world generation, which of course was more like a 2D thing than a you know, full 3D world or whatever, was based on fractal math. And that's why they called it fractalis. Wow. So it was, so it's yeah. per, it was procedural generation in yes, a way? Yes, it's doing procedural generation based on fractals. Wow. And somewhere there were some programmers who felt like they were you know, stirring a pot and adding eye of newt and you know, horn of toad into it. And then a genie was appearing. You know, just look at that. We're generating a world that doesn't exist and making a game out of it. Wow. So cool. Do you think the people, when they started doing this, do you think they realized kind of the philosophical implications of this or they just thought it was fun? Like, I, I just wonder because sometimes these things take some time to actually realize, wow, this is actually, we're creating a world that doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, I would sincerely hope they were having fun. Because I don't want to bring this down with any of the sort of negative, negative things that go on in our industry. We do have to have some responsibilities. Uh, we can't have fun with people's data in their lives. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, have yeah. to, we have to take certain of our responsibilities uh, very seriously. But people should, at some point, be almost giggling. At some point in your day or your week, I hope you're giggling and just going, oh, <laughs> this is amazing. Like, that's, that's such a genuine... Uh, feeling that all humans share. Oh, look at that. 
Would you look at that? I sometimes turn on, I'm, I'm not into cars, but sometimes I watch on YouTube these ridiculous videos where, you know, uh, a fellow took this old Volvo and he stuck a truck engine in it and a super a turbocharger he bought on eBay. And, uh, and, uh, and this car is now a drag racer. Oh my God. And, I, and, and, and like, how can you not? Like, I get it. I would not do that with my spare time. But I totally get, like, <laughs> this is hilarious. All these Lamborghinis and whatever, and I have an old bobble with a truck engine and an eBay turbocharger. Like, how, how is that not funny? That's hilarious, you know? I do feel uh, recently the machine learning space has become a little bit like this. Has be, It has become a lot more accessible for kind of people just trying out things, right? Like, there's this mm -hmm. thing called Fast AI. It's just this library that kind of wraps all these best practices. And then you can, you know, generate a convolutional neural network in like three or four lines of code and then just tweak just enough to make it work. But basically, just with the basics, you get such amazing accuracy not state of the art, but you, you can get to a state of the art with that. And it's really funny. Like maybe someone is actually working with a team of 25 people in a Lamborghini in the machine learning world, but you can, on your own time, you can just build a classifier of dogs and cats, you know, like in 10 minutes. And that's crazy. It's kind of the, the same effect that Rails had in, yeah. in the web, uh, web app world, at least from my point of view, I started learning with Rails. Absolutely. And I think that's beautiful. I, you know, I've seen this happen multiple times. You know, like the PC, I wasn't sort of involved in the mini computer revolution, but I, I sort of came of age with the, with the personal computer revolution. You know, um, I remember uh, the Altair. I remember the first time IBM PC came out. I remember Apple IIs when they were the new thing. I remember the failure of the Apple III, which nobody remembers. <laughs> I remember them trying with the Apple Lisa and then trying again with Macintosh you know, which did change the industry. And every time you make something more available, you have more lottery tickets for magic to happen. The vast majority of people aren't going to do anything. I never wrote a big framework that everyone used. I wrote a couple of different things, some of which were used in-house and some weren't. But, you know, I never wrote Rails or something. But DHH did, you know, and Ruby helped make that possible. The more people can try something, the, the more lottery tickets the industry has for some kind of magic to take place. I can't predict where it will strike, but I can predict that if, if in one area we have twice as many lottery tickets as the other, I'm gonna say that area has double the chance of some new magic thing coming out. That doesn't mean that if you're in the other area, if you're comfortable using Java and Ruby comes out, you don't need to switch. But if there's a whole bunch of people that can get into the Ruby that couldn't get into Java for whatever reason, okay. And Java, in fact, in its day, opened things up. Smalltalk, when it first came out, required very specialized hardware and whatever you know, that needed to be very powerful. So Java, you know, was kind of an enabler of its own. And I, I think that's just fantastic that we get these successive generations of technology in hardware, in software, in programming languages, in frameworks. And the most exciting ones to me are always the ones that bring in new people to an idea. You know, the example you gave, fast AI, the example of, you know, JavaScript, a huge number of people in the, in the world have access to a web browser. So many more people have access to programming in, in, in JavaScript than in Ruby, you know, just because of the way it, the way it is. You can try things in uh, Babel has a try it. You can try little snippets of code or you can, uh, there are some other JavaScript uh, sites on the web where you can try things and even try little user, you know, interface things for free. Software as a service obviously is optimizing around, you know, big companies being able to, you know, take advantage of Amazon and stuff. But there's an amazing number of things you can do if you can afford a couple of bucks nowadays to host servers and things like that, that were just completely impossible 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, hosting was, oh, yes, um, you can mount one of your hardware servers in a rack in our data center. You know, that wasn't something you or I could just try something. But, you know, now hosting is like an option anybody from anywhere in the world with some PayPal or some Bitcoins or, or some hard currency, you know, can, can fire up on, at low money. You can even do wild things with Lambda and fast AI. I have no idea. But I'm going to bet that if we look around, if not now, by, the end, by this time next year, there'll probably be somewhere in, that offers that kind of thing as a, as a service. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. can try it for your startup. There's, a, there's quite a few, um, actually, that just offer kind of templates, even Amazon AWS AMIs with FastAI yeah, stuff. Yeah, and to me, that's so exciting. 
you know, getting back to conferences, if you go to a conference and you see something exciting, and then you have to sit down and say, okay, let's make a six month plan in order to start playing with this. That's a big hill to climb. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Some people are very dedicated. It's basically a friction it's a problem, friction right? Problem. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, but yeah. how magic is it if someone's talking about something and then during the break, two people are over in the corner with their laptops pointing and talking excitedly and like tapping away and trying that feedback loop from idea to let me play with it. The tighter you make that, the sooner you get results. Yeah. I remember when I was getting started with Ruby, the, the whole try Ruby thing was really game changing for me. It's like, I can go and even show my friends. I showed some of my non-programmer friends like, oh, I'm learning this thing. It's Ruby. I mean, they didn't care, but I showed them, oh, look, I can do these commands. And then I, I was a bit confused and I tried to write some Rails code in, the, in there as well. I was like, oh, I don't know why it doesn't work, you know, at the beginning. But <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was really good, like having that interactive experience. And I think nowadays the frameworks and all these libraries that come out, um, they put a lot more emphasis in documentation and interactive experiences and examples which uh, maybe something uh, some people might think that it's a, a waste of time or waste of resources, but I don't think so. I think because there's a lot of noise out there when you see something that has, you know, people have been putting thought into it and care and documentation and examples, then I trust it more. Like, even if I don't know anything about the underlying quality of the software, but I just trust it more. To me, it's a statement that people are really thinking about your experience as a user. As a programmer, you're as much of a user of a language or a framework as I am a user of you know, Amazon's website. And when you see people doing that, they're saying they're committed to your experience. What you just said, you know, that you, you know, are more likely to use or more likely to invest your time in a framework where people have put work into the documentation and the examples and so on, 100%. I know um, advertisement from my employer, PagerDuty. You know, if you go to our API, api.pagerduty.com, and look at it, not only do we have documentation and examples, but we have this try it out feature next to each one of the things. If you want to try the API, like for users and so on, there's a way to, se to select some things with options. I want to do this, this, and this, and then it shows you the code. And then you can send it off to a trial server and see what the response would be, because we want to make it easy for people. And if we do, the, we do that as a corporation, obviously we have, that's part of our mission, it's something we invest in. But if you then look in open source and see people investing their, their sweat and their time into making the same experience, you know that it's part of their mission that you be successful. They're not just putting up a framework to brag about their cool framework with their cool feature. They're actually sitting down and thinking, how do I make Joseph, Reg, whomever successful? Uh, we've brushed over, I think, software ethics in a little bit of our conversations. And I'd, I'd really like to focus on this for a second. And one of the questions that I, I would have is, what is the most important question in software ethics today? Because there's the whole thing about data privacy. Um, there's machine learning algorithms being used by very different companies for very different purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, many of us live in difficult times. And, and we can't just divorce oh, I do this programming and that's different than me as a person and my responsibilities to my society, to my fellow citizens, to my family, you know, to my neighbors. I like to think that, you know, if you sat down and you said, oh, I'm an electrical engineer. And someone said, well, what kind of electrical engineering do you do? You know, you couldn't say, oh, well, I make bombs, but I don't really care what I make because all I care about is electrical signals on wires. Like, obviously, if you make, you, if you make bombs... You might be, I make bombs because it makes a lot of money and I don't care who gets killed. That's one kind of person. Another kind of person says, I make bombs because in the past, my country has been overrun or, you know, and whatever. And the security of our nation depends upon our having, you know, these things as a deterrent. It's not for me to say, you know, whether one of these two things is right or it's wrong, but I'm pretty sure if we talk to an electrical engineer who makes bombs, that they have thought about this and they've decided what is right for them. And I think that's true for us in software as well that you can't just say, oh, well, we're in software, we're in computers, and all we care about is the program. What we do with the program matters, and we have to face our responsibilities to decide what we're doing and for it to be intentional. I may disagree with somebody who says, I work for Facebook, and I think Facebook is a good for the world and whatever, but at least I can recognize that that person has thought about it and has a position on it, as opposed to, 
why are you asking me about ethics or why are you asking me whether what my company does and whether it's good? It's just a job. I think we have to take a position. The position you take may not be a position I agree with, but I do think we have a responsibility to think about the fact that our actions have consequences and to be okay with the choice we make. I think that's so true. I think it's a step that we have yet to take. I think people still think of tech as kind of this ethereal thing that is disconnected or divorced from from the effects of what we do, basically. Yes. Recently, well, not so recently, uh, many months ago, I, I met um, this guy uh, at a meetup in London and I asked him, so what do you do? And he's like, I'm a data scientist. I'm like, wow, that's great. You know, he's like, I do machine learning and some kind of artificial intelligence. That's what people call it these days. And I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. Um, so where do you work? And he's like, I work for Cambridge Analytica. And at the time, there wasn't, you know, the, the scandal wasn't even out, right? And, but I thought like, hmm, I've heard something fishy about that. I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> what it is, but... And then I didn't ask further because I, I didn't feel it was, you know, my position to actually ask. But then I thought, these people, do they think like why they're doing what they're doing? I mean, it could be just a way to advance their careers. You know, like some people need to get experience and a lot of people justify that, you know, I just get whatever job I can. It's a it's a big company. I work with really smart people and I learned a lot. Right. Um, but still, like, I think you should always ask yourself, like, why why you're doing what you're doing? Precisely. I, th I think we I think we we have to ask ourselves this question. Sometimes that is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's very comfortable. I met with uh, someone from the tech industry in Toronto. We had a coffee, um, and they asked me. They said, "Oh, you know, pager duty like that's a lot of enterprise software." Like, <laughs> but you, you know, I read you online, and you're like a socialist guy, and you know, what's up with that? And I said, first, the people who work at pager duty are really good people, and that's rare. And I said, second. I'm very comfortable with the fact that for me, if I make an open source tool, a lot of individuals can just decide whether they want to use it or not. Then a lot of small companies, they can get together in one meeting and decide whether to adopt this thing or not. And that's beautiful. But all of the programmers, if I'm making this open source tool, who work in a big enterprise, they cannot just decide to use my tool. There are a few things, maybe a text editor or whatever, they can decide for themselves. But almost everything, what I would call interesting, like a choice of a programming language or the choice of a framework or, you know, any other tool like this, any tool that involves two or more people, when you get in a big company, you can't just decide to use it. There's a whole procurement process. The you know, security people need to review it, make sure that, you know, it's not sending all of the company secrets to, to you know, a server. And I don't want to say where, because it'll seem like I'm aligning them, but somewhere. Um, the, there's, um, you can't, if you're going to charge money for it, you can't just say, oh, It's, you know, $25, pay for it with your PayPal. You actually have to make sure that you fit within their procurement process in order to be an approved vendor. You probably have to send salespeople because unfortunately, the big enterprise companies, they make it so difficult to sell something to you. And this is not my observation. Joel Spolsky observed this, that it becomes very expensive to sell things to big companies, which means you have to charge a lot of money just to cover the cost of having your salespeople selling things to big companies. And the next thing you know, you're charging a lot of money for your product. And you also have to spend a lot of time working on the kinds of features that enterprises need, like the kind of security and permissions and so on. So, but what do you get out of it? You get that, unlike with your regular open source thing, you can go and make this actually possible for all the people who are working in those companies who would not otherwise be able to use your better tool. Yeah, So that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's a trade-off. I do have to work with, you know, I can tell you a feature that I've been working on in the last couple of weeks. You know, the, one of the things we have to sit down and think about is how it fits with the permissions that our larger clients need and so on. And, you know, what can be seen and who can see it and who can edit it. The, those companies care about that. Do I personally care about that? Or does it work that way at PagerDuty? That's not relevant. The point is, if I want whatever benefit I'm creating to be available for people who are working in those companies... I have to work in a framework that it, that can actually be available for them to use. And that is, that is why I'm very comfortable with making enterprise software. Now, I wouldn't say everyone should agree with me on that, but I would say that everyone, for whatever they're doing, should be able to think about it and be able to articulate, as I just have, why they're comfortable with this thing, even if it's not what everybody else might necessarily want to do. You need, you need to be able to say, yeah, I do this thing and, and these are my reasons and, and I, I can put my head on my pillow at night and be satisfied. 
And I'm never going to wake up one day and say, you know what? It wasn't worth it. Yeah. Actually, this connects with a topic that I've been really interested about recently, which is intentionality. It's kind of related to this whole like new uh, minimalism movement, right? They, they say like you should live deliberately. You should make choices instead of just let them happen to you. And I think we as programmers, we're, we're really privileged. We, we have a lot of choice for jobs as well. So asking these questions is, in our case, is even more important because pretty realistically, we can change jobs tomorrow if, if we wanted to. If, if you've been programming for like two or three years, there's definitely a job for you, probably wherever you're living. There's kind of no excuse to actually ask yourself, you know, why am I, am I doing this? Am I, am I happy doing it? You know, some people really are unhappy with what they're doing and they and then some other people are very comfortable with their job. But it's important to actually think about it instead of just letting it happen. Yes. Intentionality. I, I support what you're saying 100%. It's, it's a much better way than I was putting it. But it, it really unlocks so much. And sometimes, you know, you watch a video of a TED Talk or whatever, and it's, uh, it's what I call self-actualization uh, signaling. Um, for, for those of our listeners who are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, you're, you've got your food and shelter at the bottom. And then I, I forget the exact order. There's belonging to a group is somewhere in the middle and, and so on. And this, I think the seventh level is self-actualization where you're kind of like getting in touch with yourself. A lot of these kinds of people are constantly going on about how they're getting in touch with their true selves and, you know, going off and meditating and Rangoon or whatever. And they're, they're really just bragging about how they have the privilege, the money and the time to do things that are not particularly productive, like paint, you know, or I could tell, talk to you about how I'm trying to teach myself a new musical instrument or whatever, which is kind of telling everyone, oh yeah, I have time and inclination to do something that does not involve feeding myself or my family. When I talk about these things, I don't want to make it seem like I'm talking about that like about meditation or about getting in touch with your inner self or about, you know, you know, learning an instrument for the sake of learning an instrument or, or deciding to quit your job and go and get a PhD or whatever. I mean, if those, if that's what you want to do, do it. Being intentional, you know, and getting in touch with why you're doing the things you're doing is just as important when you're trying to just pay the rent, just eat, you know, get psychological security and so on as it is when you know, you sold your startup and you've got, you're sitting on a couple of hundred million American dollars in cash and trying to decide what to do next. That is part of your everyday life. Be intentional, make ch choices, swim. Don't be a leaf on the, on the stream that is just being carried by the current. Choose where you're going. Think about what you're doing. Yeah. You know, be, be comfortable with it. Exactly. You know, and that's just as valid, you know, it, I had a, there was a, a fellow who's not exactly a mentor, but I knew him in business and he had four men's clothing stores and things didn't go well. And he had to close three of them. And then he made a deal with his creditors for the fourth and he was selling a whole bunch of stuff out of this. And however it ended up, he was running like a closeout sale in his last store. And in his, what at the time was a luxury SUV, he was delivering pizza at night to pay the bills. So he was not in a place where he could spend a lot of time meditating and thinking about grand thoughts. But still, when I talked to him about it, he was intentional about his choices. He was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm doing this thing and this part of this. And he had to ask his employees to take like a big pay cut and he was getting no pay. And he was like telling people, yeah, I'm, I'm like delivering pizza at night to get by because I'm not getting, taking any money out of the business while we go through this, this difficulty. You know, he was being intentional about it. So even in a difficult situation, it's not necessarily about being rich and having a lot of free time. It's just about deciding that you want to be comfort. You want to know who you are and you want to be comfortable with what you do. There's a talk. I don't think I'll ever give it again in my life, but I have given a talk about my experience with a book called um, Learned Optimism by Martin Seligman. And he goes into this in much more depth. Um, but one of the things he talks about is... Um, looking at things in your life and being able to correctly sort of classify those things that you are doing it by choice and that you're responsible for and those things that really are not your responsibility. For example, um, if you are at Full Stack Fest and you take my advice and the person ahead of you, the coffee, as they're pouring the coffee and you're pouring the coffee, you make eye contact with them and you say, what did you think of Ragnwald's dancing? 
if that person kind of looks at you for a moment, doesn't say anything and then turns away, you know, there, it's very possible that you could say to yourself, oh my, did I say something rude or whatever? You know, you can kind of take it on your own shoulders or whatever. It, it, they're, they're not responding to me. Could be entirely in their head. It might have nothing to do with me. And without, you know, getting into Seligman's theories and so on, I would recommend people who are interested in this subject, read the book, Learned Optimism, or Google Learned Optimism. Um, you know, the business of looking at your life and thinking very hard about which things are really my responsibility. I have control. I have choice over this. And within that view, am I making the right choices? And then understanding these other things are not in my control. I have influence over them, perhaps, a minor influence, but I can't completely control them. There no salesperson. You will meet multi-million dollar earning salespeople, best in their field. And none of them will tell you that they can make every sale. They don't have 100% control. Nobody has 100% control. So part of a good mental health is, having, is, is being able to work out how to differentiate those things where you have that choice and then making the, the, the right choices or the choices that are consistent with be, you being your authentic self versus those where you don't have control. And um, when I described at the beginning of our conversation, my glee with magic, my glee was not the machine is magic. My glee, honestly, was a very selfish. I made magic. And, and, and that's something I don't think we should ever let go of. We write software for ourselves, for the feeling we have. We write software for other people. We write software so that somebody who didn't have a job can now deliver food on their motorbike or their bicycle. You might say, this is wonderful. You might say, this is bad, the gig economy. You might have an opinion. But we're writing things that, so that we can change society in a very small way. This person in this enterprise does this thing. Or in a very big way that changes everything creating a new framework that brings another billion programmers online with their ideas, whatever it is, we're always doing something involving people and spending time thinking about the impact we have on people and the impact people have on us. It's not in addition to our work, thinking about programs and languages and frameworks. It's part of our work. It's part of the same fabric. It's just a different aspect of it. This is why I'm against terms like soft skills and so on. Yeah, they're they're not a different kind of skill. It's just yeah. like it's it's all yeah. part of the same. You know, it's it's like it's like arguing. If we go to the orchestra together, are we going to argue about which are the real instruments and which don't really count? I mean, do we say, oh, the basses that doesn't really count because they're just like holding down the low end? You know, they're, it's, they're not as important as the violins who have all the exciting music. No, it's, it's all part of the fabric of the music, right? <laughs> and, so, and so all these things we're talking about, although they may not be the first thing that comes to mind when people say, oh, there's a tech interview or an interview with a person in tech. It's like, but they're all part of tech. They're all part of what we do. Um, I think another thing that you kind of do to connect more with the human side of things is writing about programming, right? You write all these books and um, you've written six books. You've published six books and you're writing another one, right? Yes. I think six. I don't know the exact number. Um, but yes, I am writing another one called Functions All the Way Down, making fun of the of an oft-told story about turtles all the way down, about recursion. Yeah. Um, so writing for me is at least 50%, maybe as much as 80% selfishness because the act of trying to explain something, you know, people talk about rubber duck programming. Writing is a kind of rubber duck yeah. programming. The act of trying to explain something forces you to organize your thoughts and to find places where there's a hole in your thoughts and go learn them. And also in the act of organizing your thoughts and trying to explain them and trying to put them in a particular order so that people can absorb them. What should I, I have to explain this first. A lot of things are very circular. If you actually were to write down okay, in order to, to explain this, you need to know this and this and this and this. You'd like to think that it's all a directed acyclic graph and that there is an order that you can learn them. But then really, it's not a directed graph. Sometimes things curve around on themselves so that you end up, in order to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. That's a joke. But there's a lot of things like that in our industry where you kind of have to take something on faith, learn some more, and then come back and you understand the thing you were just in. Like all the ideas are connected in a very messy way. And whichever your path is to working it out, like, you know, I write about things, um, Getify writes about the same, same topics in a completely different way. 
the, the act of finding the path itself changes you. It's not like I just download my thoughts and there's a book or a blog post. I am changed by the act of writing for the better. That's, uh, that's really interesting when you say it. like, basically writing is an active, it's not like an afterthought, like you learn something and you just kind of dump it into a blog post or a book. It's just, you learn it more by explaining it, or you change the way you think about Absolutely. it by explaining this, it. This is a hundred percent true. And I'm not a psychologist. So I want to first say that everyone should ignore what I'm about to say, but I can tell you what I believe. And what I believe is that when you interact with an idea in multiple ways, you learn it better. Now, I have a metaphor, and I'm not going to say that the metaphor should tell us how this works. It's more like this is an easy way to remember what I was saying. But um, I am learning an instrument. I think I mentioned that earlier, a new instrument. And in addition to some very basic things, scales and exercises, I've also chosen to learn a particular Bach piece, the uh, German Baroque composer. And the act of learning to play this piece, I've got lots of recordings of this music all over the place. That's not important. If that, it's not like I'm teaching myself to play it so I can hear it. But the act of learning to play the instrument with my hands forces me to interact with this music. No matter how many times I've heard it before, it forces me to interact with it with a different set of pathways in my brain, my fingers and so on. It's a stringed instrument, so I have to serve certain fingering problems like how do I move from this to this to this to this? And how do I, you know, I have, to, I have to solve problems in order to teach myself how to play it. And the act of solving problems is actually helping me to interact with the music with some different sort of parts of my brain than I do when I just listen. And of course, there's a third thing. I'm forced to pick up a piece of writing where all the notes are written out. And so I have to read the music. And I'm not really brilliant at sight reading, so sometimes I have to pick through it slowly. And the act of reading it with my eyes, playing it with my hands, or reading it with my eyes while listening to somebody play it so I can get a feel for it, it's like a third set of pathways into my brain around this music. And I would almost describe myself not so much as learning to play this tune, but learning to listen to the tune with my hands. Wow, that's a, that's a really beautiful metaphor, it's, actually. It's how I feel. And, you know, so... Mm. One of the beauties of giving a talk, when you see a call for papers or a call for presentations, jump on it. Because when you are accepted to give a talk, you have a date, which forces you to complete the talk. Exactly. Deadline-driven development, D -D -D. right? Yes, exactly. And my own experience with talks, and this was different from being an MC, is that if I have a date, it forces me to go through this with the subject matter of my talk. And, and, and there might be a particular idea. I may have played with it, writing code. But then in preparing a presentation, I have to think about it a different way. And even if, even if you look at it and you say, oh, this presentation, isn't this the same thing you talked about in these two blog posts? The act of redoing them into a presentation format, because what works in a presentation is very different than what works in a blog post, which is very different than what works as one chapter of a larger narrative in a book. So the act of repurpose, even if I'm repurposing some material that was already published as a blog post, I am interacting with it again. I am putting it in particular order. I'm thinking about the way the ideas connect. I'm thinking about how to express them. I'm dealing with the constraints on the one hand of the presentation medium, but also other aspects that are not available. For example, if I'm trying to communicate a feeling or something, I have body language. I have the tone of my voice. I don't have to think about it. I'm not an actor. I don't know how to fake this. But I know for a fact that if I talk about something that I'm excited about, just like now, I speak a little bit more quickly. My tone of voice changes. I, you know, people cannot see, see me, but right now I'm gesturing with my hands because this is, this is and, and we humans, we pick this up. So um, when you start to interact with something and say, I've got a presentation, this forces you to go and learn that material to interact with it. It's even though you're writing, you're actually kind of learning the material. I have a couple more questions that I kind of have, like, I need to ask Go you ahead. this. Okay, so one of them is like, it's also around the books uh, you've written and the blogs. Um, so now I know why you write them, but I wonder how do you organize your time to write? Like a lot of people think, oh, I could never write a book, let alone six books or like, or seven, you know? Yes, I'm not very good at that. I'll be, I'll be very blunt. Um, I am a father. I have a full-time job. I don't know how much work I do, but I'm certainly employed. <laughs> um, with writing, how it got started was around 2004 or something, I started to blog. 
And then at that time, writing books and so on was, a, was much more lucrative than it is today. But there was a lot of friction in the process, a lot of friction, you know, physical computer books in bookstores and so on. And the economics of shipping books on atoms said that books had to have a certain length and so on. And it was very daunting. But blogging removed all those frictions. You could just, you had one idea, you could just write it. And then you could get feedback right away. And I found that very exciting, that you could get feedback right away. I mean, there was old things like the Joel on software forum and so on where I got feedback. Hacker News didn't exist in those days. Reddit hadn't been created yet. You know, but there were places where you, know, you could post things and get feedback. And that immediate feedback was something. It was something very different than writing a, a book on paper. And I found that very exciting. But I did, I did get more popular over the years. And people would regularly email me to talk about a book. And every time I talked to them about the process, it would be brutal. Oh, you do these things in Microsoft Word, and your editor does this, and we set up this schedule where the chapters are due. And it was just like the complete opposite of what was working for me as a writer. Then when lightweight publishing options came out, I happened to use leanpub.com, but which is actually a Canadian product, which I like already. But there, there are others. And when those lightweight things came out, that's when I became interested in writing books. I started, as many people do, if you already have blog content, in organizing the content you already have into a book form. And I did some experimenting like that, and it worked out. And then I sat down to write the book that is now JavaScript Allongé. I actually was very crafty about it. I was not working at the time. And so I had, I had time. And I decided to launch a prototype first. So I wrote a book called Coffee Script Ristretto. And from the beginning, I knew I wanted to write for JavaScript, but I also didn't want to get off to the wrong foot. You know, like if there's a lot of criticism, I felt that the market for JavaScript was about, I estimated about 10 times the market for CoffeeScript at the time. It was probably 20 times or something. But so I estimated that I could take some chances and learn from CoffeeScript. And then if everything was going well, I would write the same book again in JavaScript. And that's what I did. I wrote CoffeeScript Ristretto. And ristretto, for those who don't know, is kind of an Italian word meaning restricted or short, like a really short coffee. And then came JavaScript allongé, which is a French word meaning long, kind of like a long coffee. And it was longer. I had more material. And I, I repurposed a bunch of the material from CoffeeScript ristretto. And then later on, I brought out the sixth edition, um, ES6 or JavaScript 2015, add a lot of stuff. And then later I merged in some material from, I wrote a book called JavaScript Spasore, which is about, about metaprogramming, object-oriented programming. And then that wasn't very successful and I could see why. And so I ended up merging it into my JavaScript book. So all the important material from that is still there. But you came back about the time. And it always came down to the same thing, which was when, even when I was deciding that I was going to write a book, I released all of my material as blog posts first. To get the feedback. To get the feedback. I use LeanPub, but there are other products out there, which really allow you to keep republishing the same thing because it's, it's a digital format and you can update it. You can send an email. There's a new version of my book out or whatever. And I took that very seriously. So I got feedback from people who actually were reading the book. They're allowed to read it in progress. Um, so when it comes to the question of finding time, obviously it helps if you decide to write while you're unemployed or something. But even now that I'm employed... The key for me is I found a way to write my books in little, little chunks, one blog post at a time. And so for me, there's an activity of writing a blog post and getting feedback. And there's another activity of organizing it into the book. And the vital part in order to make the book possible, given that I have other, other things like parenting and so on, is to find ways to break it up into very small pieces, a blog post at a time, here, there, and then later integrate them. I'm sure a lot of people would be able to kind of take that time to organize their thoughts and maybe put them in a in a book form. And I love reading books. Like, I mean, blog posts are, are great, but when someone has taken the time to put everything in a book, like in a really well-structured manner with a with an argument that goes from the beginning to end, it's, it feels really satisfying to read it all at once. I can learn from their thoughts, like kind of in a compressed way. Like maybe it's years of thinking, years of experience, but just compressed down to to a book. So I really appreciate that. I wonder as well, like in, in all your books, like all these references to coffee, I wonder what your relationship with coffee is. Like, do you love coffee? Um, are you a coffee nerd or like what, what is up? I do love coffee, um, but I'm not a coffee snob. As a matter of fact, I kind of joke about this. There's a lot of things that are like this and, and I make the, I, I make this joke. 
The difference between an aficionado and a snob is that an aficionado judges the thing, coffee, and a snob judges people by the coffee they drink. Mm, yeah. And I want to be more always an aficionado. So, for example, I will take a drive through Tim Hortons, which is our big chain of corporate coffee in Canada, coffee, and I'll drink a small black coffee and I will enjoy it. I can tell you, I do know enough about coffee to tell you all the ways in which it is not actually great coffee, but that's not the point. At the moment when I'm drinking it, I enjoy it. Um, I never want to know so much about coffee that I can't enjoy it because you can go to a negative place where you stop seeing the pluses and things and only see the minuses. You can become obsessed with them so that you're always unhappy and your search for perfection is really an attempt to end your own suffering because you're always unhappy with the imperfections in the thing. And that's actually a terrible place to be. Exactly. And it's not just coffee. That happens with frameworks and JavaScript. I often joke about JavaScript. I say, what? You know, look at this thing. How crazy is this? But, you know, I never want to get to the point where I'm, maybe this is a coffee joke that I'm making without knowing it, that I'm bitter about JavaScript. <laughs> you know, like, like I want to know what all the flaws are and so on, but I don't want to be obsessed with them. I want to be able to enjoy the programming for what it is. I may be able to tell you that another thing is better or more useful or has better affordances or a better mental model and all these things. But at the moment when I'm writing JavaScript, I'm going to still enjoy myself. And so it is with coffee. Um, I have a small collection of coffee making machines at home. I make espresso at home. I have a, a fairly usable machine. I make coffee. But sometimes at work, I'll just get a coffee out of the machine. I don't, we have an espresso machine at work. I don't always make an espresso. And I want to be the kind of person that can enjoy whatever coffee is in front of me. So I would describe myself as a coffee lover, but definitely not a coffee snob. I don't judge people by it. And I don't want to get so, I don't ever want to be so into it or anything that my entire worldview is based on the negatives rather than the positives. Yeah, that, that resonates so well with me because um, I used to be a coffee snob and actually someone uh, told me, I think, don't judge things for what they're not, Yes, but rather for what they are. So that's something that I kept doing as a coffee snob is um, I ended up judging every coffee for yes. what it is not. And that never made me happy. Yes. It's impossible. Your search for perfection is actually an attempt to alleviate your own suffering. Yeah, I think that's a, there's a deep life lesson in coffee. <laughs> So I'd like to ask you just three more questions. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I'm, I'm kind of like conscious that, you know, we, we could be talking for like an entire day. Um, but it's kind of three short questions. One is your, basically it's your favorite dish, uh, the most thrilling experience of your life and a book that you'd like to recommend. Oh, my favorite dish. I think, although I don't have it as often as perhaps I should, I think I'm going to go with risotto, the Italian rice dish. I really, I really, along the way, I learned to make risotto badly. And um, I really just love all the different things you can do with it. Interesting. What's, what kind of risotto? The, the mush <laughs> one or there's a pumpkin oh, there's so risotto? Many. Like... Um, th and I'm not going to tell you. So I'm just going to say in general, because part of, I can't pick one because that's part of my point in saying risotto is the fact that there's so many different things you can do with it. But to give you an example of, one, of, of the kinds of things people might not think about, Uh, one of the things you can do with risotto is you can make a dessert risotto. For example, you can use, instead of reducing like a, a, a wine uh, and um, stock, you can, uh, you can actually use like a cream and reduce it. You can infuse vanilla into it. Um, you can then, when you're finished making it, again with arborio rice and so on, because the starch and rice is actually sweet. Um, and when you're finished... You can actually brulee the top like a creme brulee. Interesting. I've yeah, never heard um, that. Listeners can actually Google. If you Google dessert risotto, there are all these recipes even for making desserts. So it's a very flexible dish. You can, as you say, uh, make some incredible uh, risotto based on, on, on uh, mushrooms. Um, there's uh, beautiful ones, uh, meat-based risottos like with ham. Uh, sausages and fennel is one of the most famous ones, which I think is absolutely delicious. Yeah, sausage and fennel. And they're actually so easy to make at home. Really good risottos require really good stock, which is like work in advance. But honestly, I would take a crappy risotto over a crappy pa or even average pasta dish any day of the week. I, I just love the texture and the, and the, and the way the, the taste of the food is infused through the rice. What was the next question? The most thrilling experience of your life. Okay. 
So diplomatically, every father is going to say the birth of their children. That's that's, that's just that's a required answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that shall we say comes second. Um, there have been some sports and activities I've picked up. I never felt particularly athletic as a child. I, I'm tall for my age. I sort of grew up like a very skinny and tall first, and then the, the sort of the meat filled out on the bones after later. And so for a long time, I felt kind of skinny and weak and awkward. So I sort of talked myself into thinking I was not athletic. And um, I ran for a while, and then I got into bicycle racing. And somewhere along the way, for various reasons, I found myself riding off-road, like mountain biking and cyclocross and so on. And I have a personality. I'm an essentially lazy guy. But sometimes something captures my imagination, and then I can be disciplined and keep doing something repetitively over and over again. And I remember I learned how to ride a mountain bike on a skinny rail, like only like five centimeters or narrower for a long distance and just like have the balance. I have some pictures. It's, I'm not imagining this. And it was really transformative to have this feedback that I could do this thing. And many people were saying, oh, that's amazing. I could never do that. And they're like, you couldn't do that. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that when you go riding, you prefer to go riding. You're not the type of person who would just keep riding the same thing over and over again while carefully like listening to the feedback of your body. You find that boring or something. Rock climbing was a similar thing. I could keep trying the same problem over and over again until I learned moves and stuff. I don't know if I can pick any one, but outside of the birth of my children um, and watching them grow up and so on, this revelation that I could actually do things that appeared to be very difficult or challenging, not because I had some magic ability or anything, and not because this is rare. It's really just an intentional choice that I could just be disciplined about practicing. There, the, there's an incredible thrill of feeling like you've really earned it. It's not because you were born smart and so you get programming and all this other stuff. I realize I have a lot of privileges and so on in terms of programming. But this other thing, I never felt like I had a natural ability. And so it was a revelation to discover that I could do this, this kind of thing. All right. Question three. Oh, yeah. Question three. It's probably very easy for you. Uh, it's a book that you'd like to recommend to our listeners. Oh, man. That actually is hard because there's so many. <laughs> Could be more than one. It's okay. <laughs> well, earlier I mentioned learned optimism, and I already recommended that, so I'm not going to say that now. I, I really do, that was that that one. I, I'm not kidding. It transformed my life when I was in a very dark place. It was part of my coming back from a dark place in my life, and so it has a lot of meaning for me. But um, I'm going to recommend a book by Richard Feynman, Feynman, the physicist. Oh. Yes. Called QED. So uh, that stands for quantum electrodynamics. And I think the subtitle is The Strange Theory of Light and Matter. I heard about it because there is a program that you could get on a Macintosh. Very, very amusing program, which allowed you to look around. It was like, it was like on a, one of these CD things, CD-ROM things back when that was a thing. And it allowed you to explore the office of artificial intelligence pioneer Marvin Minsky. And you could click on things and then he would explain to you what they were. And one of them was a mirror in his office. And when you clicked on the mirror, he said, you know, this is a mirror. And I can't remember the exact story as to why that mirror was significant to me personally. But what I remember is that he then said, and there's this amazing book called QED where Richard Feynman explains how light reflects off a mirror. And he explains that everything we think about how light reflects off a mirror is wrong. And I was joking earlier today that if, we, if that book was published today with the way the internet works, the subtitle, instead of being The Strange Theory of Light and Matter, would be Falsehoods Humans Believe About Light. <laughs> Just like falsehoods humans believe about time or name or dates or whatever, right? It was exactly this. And in these four lectures, which were then um, compiled into a book, Feynman talks about all the things we think that light, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction, that if you point a beam of light at a mirror and, you know, it makes a little like oval or circle where, and th that the, the light only interacts with the spot where it touches the mirror. All of those things are wrong. Light actually interacts with all of the mirror, even the parts that the light isn't, we don't think the light is pointing at, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All, it, like all these falsehoods, we, you know, it's not the way we think intuitively. But it's also interesting in that 
many of the principles he was explaining, you needed to, to be involved in like graduate physics and even postgraduate physics in order to understand. So he had to come up with various ways of using metaphors and simplifications while still teaching the fundamental, basic, correct thing that he was trying to, to teach. An obvious example that comes to mind, the mathematics that explain things like light colors and what we call frequencies of light are actually based on complex numbers, not regular scalar numbers. And he didn't want to explain complex arithmetic because it sometimes gets complicated. So he came up with a little explanation about how each photon-like thing, because it's only really a photon when we observe it, has the equivalent of a little clock with a single hand that turns. And through this mechanism, he explains in a way that's easy to understand this effect that if we actually wanted to calculate the exact numbers and so on, we, we would use complex math for it. And he does this with the whole book because it's written in such a way that you don't actually need to know anything except basic arithmetic in order to understand all the things he explains. And what I thought was really interesting is that choosing which things to simplify and which things to say it's not simple. So the act when he was putting together those lectures, which became this book, was he was curating which things will I simplify and which things will I tell you. And that act is a really, really interesting one. It applies to writing books ourselves. We talked about that earlier. It, it, it applies to explaining things to people. It applies to writing a, t a talk, preparing a talk. That's an art, basically. Yes. And I think his style is very famous because of that, right? Because he's really, really great at, com at simplifying very, very, very complex things. Yes. I think that, yeah, his ability was exceptional. And I think even for those of our listeners who don't want to be writers... We all communicate, we all write our thoughts down, we all think about problems, and we all have to make these kinds of decisions. What part will I kind of go, yeah, whatever, it's a, that's an implementation detail, I don't really need to think about it very hard. And what parts of it are, this I do need to understand, because it matters. And I think this book, QED, well, A, I think it's a very, very fascinating read in its own right. And I think you can read it like that and enjoy it and just stop right there if you want to. But if you're also interested in thinking about thinking and thinking about communicating, then I think there's a lot to learn by going back again and looking at it and really going, oh, I see what he did here. Yeah, you're, def you're definitely the nth person who recommends <laughs> me this book. So I think it's about time to, that I should read it already. <laughs> Good, my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a fantastic conversation. Like I've I've enjoyed it a lot. I've, in a way, it's the same thing about about um, writing, right? Talking about all these things has changed the way I think about them as well. So I think I think it's been really really inspiring. I just want to say, if I could one last time pitch Full Stack Fest, just what you're saying when you go and you have this a conversation and you and it changes the way you think about something. It's not just that you share something with someone else; they share it with you. But the act of conversing with them makes both of you grow and think. And that's what you get when you go to a conference like Full Stack Fest. And that's why you should go. Thank you. Th yeah, this has been really great. And I hope, um, yeah, I hope we'll bump into each other again uh, somewhere in the world. Uh, maybe Barcelona again. Thank you so much for your time. To all the listeners, thank you so much for, for listening to our exchange. And I already feel blessed by our paths having crossed. And should they cross again, so much the better. And to our listeners, I hope you've all enjoyed this episode. If you want to check out this year's lineup and get your tickets, you can go to fullstackfest.com. Until next time, and see you all in September. Bye.